Councilmember Gerald Kaminsky. Present. Councilmember Brian Nowak. Present. Councilmember Brian Polarski. Present. Councilmember Richard Rusiniak. Here. And Supervisor Diane Benchkowski. Here. Okay. Uh, we have seven present. First item of discussion is the LED, LED streetlight conversion presentation from a Wendell Companies. Um, you have the floor. Adam and Keith, that's right, Keith. Adam and Keith from Wendell Companies. Let me just get that information in here. everyone it's a pleasure to be here my name is Adam Tabelski my colleague Keith Krug we're from Wendell we're here to talk about uh, an exciting opportunity that we foresee for the town to consider that is upgrading the street lighting in the town to LED technology so we've uh, provided uh, the town um, just very recently with a hard, an advanced copy of this presentation uh, we have additional hard copies with us um, be sharing it on the screen as well and we can leave hard copies after the fact or if anyone needs one now we could certainly pass them out working a moment ago. Sorry for the delay, folks. I appreciate it. Um, we're very pleased to be here again. My name's Adam, my colleague Keith. And certainly, if you have any questions as we're going along, please feel free to uh, uh, ask away, whatever your uh, normal protocol is. Just a quick word about Wendell. I don't know if you're familiar with Wendell. Wendell is a, a multidisciplinary architecture and engineering firm established here in Western New York in 1940. We've been doing municipal work for decades and decades now. Uh, we're, we're pleased to be doing work currently, ongoing work for the town of Cheektowaga, namely providing uh, GIS services to the town and a smattering of some urban forestry support over the years. Um, we enjoy working for municipalities in Western New York and across the state. Uh, we're not only an architecture and engineering firm, but we also are an energy services firm and a construction firm all under the Wendell umbrella, so to speak. Um, we've been d doing over the past 20, 25 years, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of energy efficiency work for municip uh, municipalities in New York State and beyond. And just uh, one more slide quickly about who Wendell is so you know where we're coming from. Um, to, you know, today we're 81 years old with nearly 300 people. Uh, we're accredited by NIESCO, which is the industry association for uh, energy services firms such as us. We're uh, qualified by the U.S. Department of Energy. We're ISO certified. And on a daily basis, we're working with uh, a host of stakeholders, namely utilities, not only National Grid and NISAG, but others across the state, regulatory agencies such as the Power Authority, the Public Service Commission, et cetera. Uh, other uh, NYSERDA state agencies and other industry partners, in other words, manufacturers of, of technology and uh, uh, contractors as well.
So that's enough about Wendell. A word about you know transitioning into the situation in Cheektowaga as it pertains to street lighting. These are just a few simple screenshots of different types of street lighting you have here in the town that I, I grabbed from uh, Google Street Views. Um, you know, a, a variety of lights are uh, what we call cobra head lights, which are the top two examples, um, which are uh, metal arms of varying lengths attached to wooden utility poles. Um, you know, it could be 12 feet, 15 feet, there's a variety there. Uh, and the bottom two examples are different types of underground fed lighting that you have, uh, namely uh, decorative post-top style fixtures and, and also uh, sort of standalone uh, taller metal street lighting fixtures, mainly in residential areas. Um, it's common to find a, a variety of types of street lighting in, your communi in, in communities. Um, we did have a chance to review the town's street lighting utility bills, which is sort of the foundation for the presentation uh, you'll hear from us tonight. Um, uh, total number of street lights that we identified in the town that are, that are owned by utilities are, are in the approximately 7,655. You have a great deal of street lighting um, in the community. Most of those are with NYSEG, about 5,500, and they're around 2,100 uh, with National Grid. Uh, not many u municipalities have their street lighting split between two, muni uh, two utilities, but there are examples of that here in Western New York. Um, and continuing on with the, the current situation, you know, we've looked at the types of street lighting you have, and this is, a, is an excerpt from the town's 2021 adopted budget, which I just pulled from the town's website, uh, pertaining to your general street lighting district. Excuse me. Um, it, it appears, if I'm reading this right, that you're um, budgeting somewhere in the area uh, a little above $1.8 million for street lighting utility bills for National Grid and NYSEG, and then there are a number of other kinds of um, uh, related um, costs and expenditures that go along with that totaling over $2.1 million. You know, for a long time, up until three, four, five years ago, you know, every municipality um, had this sort of line item in their budget, their municipal budget, and it was just taken for granted that this was sort of a fixed cost and you just had to wait for the utility bill to come in and there was very little you could do about it or very little control you had over it. But by moving to LED technology, as, as we'll get into, it's, this presents a new opportunity for towns to reduce, significantly reduce line items in your budget. And all of the savings that we will uh, um, you know, outlay for you tonight stem from this area of what you're currently paying now. So this is an important sort of page to keep in the back of your mind. Um, as I mentioned, we did review the town's utility bills from NYSEG and National Grid. You're not really supposed to be able to make, decipher that up there, but the, the utility bills depict the quantities and the types of street lighting infrastructure that you're being charged for in your communities. That's how we arrive at the, the numbers that I, that I cited earlier. Um, and it's interesting to note that in Sheik Dewaga's case, as in every other municipal case that we've ever looked at, the majority of costs associated with your utility bill are actually not for the energy that's being used to light those street lights. It's actually for maintenance charges, what's often referred to on the bill as a facilities charge. In other words, that's the money that you're paying the utility to quote unquote maintain the light depending on whatever, however, uh, whatever level of satisfaction you may have with that, most of the, what you're paying for is the maintenance, not the energy. That's an important point to remember as we go along as well. And um, it's 19% uh, here for energy charges and 81%. I think the hard copy you may have may say 11% and 89%. I apologize for that. We mistakenly got those numbers transposed in our, in our earlier pass at this, and, but we've, we've corrected it here. Okay. I'm gonna turn it over to Keith now. Um, to talk about the concept of an energy performance contract, and that is the, uh, you'll hear that phrase uh, a lot, 
uh, this evening, and that is the project delivery method that we are, uh, that, that is um, the structure for the type of project that we're talking about implementing here. Thank you, Adam. <clears throat> so as Adam alluded to, there's usually a fixed budget in, in you know, line item for street lighting costs for most municipalities. And anytime you're faced with a project uh, of interest, you have to wrestle with how we're gonna pay for it. Um, so what's unique about energy performance contracting is that it leverages money that you're already paying the utilities. You're gonna reduce that cost and repurpose that money to pay for the cost of the project over time. So what this bar chart is depicting is on the left-hand column, the, the solid blue uh, indicates what your current costs are. So that 1.8 to $2 million that you're paying New York State Electric and Gas and National Grid. And through this project, you're gonna reduce those costs that you're paying to the utilities and then use a portion of that money to pay for the cost of the project financed over time. And then because the savings is so significant, it has a net positive savings even after paying the debt service. And that is considered you know, the surplus that we show there in green. And through the New York State Energy Performance Contracting Law, um, it's a mechanism to facilitate streamlined energy efficiency projects across New York State. Uh, it's been used in several public entity examples, school districts, public colleges, local governments, state agencies. This allows for the contractual obligation to be the responsibility of the energy services company to guarantee those savings in the contract such that you have the confidence in borrowing money and that savings is gonna be equal to or greater than your annual cost of doing the project. And then after that debt service is paid off, and in a case of like street lighting, these projects are normally being financed for 10 to 15 years. The street lights have a life expectancy of 25. So for the duration of their life expectancy, you have net surplus in your budget. So we took the information, as Adam alluded to, on the street lighting bills, and we prepared a cost estimate. And again, as Adam said, in the last few years, the legislation that New York State has passed has really opened up the door to hundreds of municipalities across New York State to consider these, you know, the technology as well as the buyback option. So we'll go over the economics here on the next slide. Okay. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Keith. Um, so you've seen the conceptual frame, framework for how these projects are structured. Now to return to Cheek Tawaga's example. So we've identified uh, by reviewing your utility bills, by looking at our project experience of, of implemented projects, a total project cost of approximately $9.5 million. And the first thing to do is we try to dispel a sticker shock associated with that. First, let me mention what's, what that project cost entails. It really entails four primary cost centers. That's uh, number one, the buyback cost associated with purchasing the street lighting infrastructure back from the utilities. Um, having ownership of the street lighting is a key component to being able to have the jurisdiction to go in and make the upgrades and the additional improvements. Um, we've estimated those costs. Number two, is the material itself, uh, the, the, the actual new equipment to install. And number three is the work of the installers themselves, the labor associated with the installation process. And number four are professional services uh, from uh, uh, the energy services company to deliver the project in a turnkey fashion. And as Keith mentioned earlier, it's, it's really a design build process. It's really the only exception for municipalities to take advantage of design build in New York State, a number of state agencies can do it, but um, this is a rare case where a municipality by state law can actually do a, a design build project where essentially you have one contract with an energy services company and that company is responsible for every aspect of the project from start to finish. Um, so we force, and there's also contingency built into that too. That was kind of the fifth thing I wanted to mention. Um, we are not financial advisors. This is just, 
how we are presenting the information for you to consider. And again, this is not a proposal. This is an order of magnitude of costs. We really haven't done any des detailed engineering or anything like that yet. But this is a review of your bills and developing a, a sense of the viability of a project for you to consider. So if we were to finance a project at 10 years with an interest rate of 3% and these variables can all be changed, um, we anticipate the town would save in the ballpark of $30 million over 25 years over the life of the equipment. Um, those are some of the high level numbers. Um, the, so that's an all in project cost there. And when you look at the uh, graph below, so the green bars represent total savings. The blue bars represent total costs. So any year in which the green bar is taller than the blue bar, your savings exceeds your cost. And essentially, a, you're, you're in a cash flow positive situation. So as you can see, this project is cash flow positive on an annual basis, even in the first year. Um, it, a lot of times, think about a payback period. With a project such as this, it's not like you need to wait five, seven, ten years to start realizing savings. You realize savings beginning in year one and every year thereafter. And you can see, and, and you may understand it, after the, the project financing ends, the savings increase uh, very significantly. Um, uh, you know, and it, in those initial years, you, you know, you're looking at a potential savings range of four or five hundred thousand dollars and it goes to well over a million dollars in the out years after year after year 10. This is uh, a, you know normally when a municipality is undertaking a capital project the first thing you think about is how are we going to pay for it and usually if you're thinking about any kind of borrowing or financing that is a that is a um, drag on the town budget for for lack of a, a better word this is a really unique case where the financial solution as to how to pay for it is built right into the project economics and you see savings at the end of it. Um, we consider it a win-win. That's why a number of municipalities have been looking at LED technology and other sorts of energy efficiency measures. And if I could add something while we're on the slide, because it's important to know that taking over these assets does have a cost. So in the blue bars, is not only your financing payment, your debt service, is also the cost of the ownership. So we model the ownership cost over the life of the system and that's been included. So there's hundreds of thousands of dollars which adds up to millions of dollars in those blue bars that goes in the rainy day fund, the maintenance fund. So we're not claiming all the savings in the green. A portion of that has been attributed to future maintenance costs. And I think that's an important distinction. I'm not sure all companies do that, but in our detailed financial models, uh, which have been built on other municipalities who have owned their own street lighting. Um, for example, the town of Greece outside of Rochester has owned their own street lighting, street lighting for you know, over a decade. And we have, they've shared their records, so we have some real you know, data that goes into what it costs for a municipality to own and operate their own street lighting system, as well as the projects that we've been doing over the last five years. Maybe we could just pause here, maybe we could just pause here to ask if there are any questions about the economics. Um, um, I think we'll, we have more to talk about in terms of frequently asked questions and, and you know some of the other impacts on the community. But having a grasp of the financial impact is is really key because that's a that's a major hurdle to get over. So I don't know. We're happy to answer any questions if anyone has Excuse one. Me. I have a yes. question. Uh, when you talk about um, ownership. What are you actually owning? The, the head and the light bulb, or the arm, or the pole, or what is it? It's a very good question, Councilwoman, and the upcoming slide will answer that and clarify, because that's a very popular question. Typically outside contract. That's also coming up in the next couple slides, um, because it's important how you structure that, um, because generally speaking, municipalities really do want the burden within house resources to maintain street lights. So we help them set up a third party contract and there's specialty contractors that focus on street lighting maintenance. Right so off the bat, you've anticipated two out of the three of the most right. commonly asked questions. <laughs> I just have a quick question. What is, what is the turnaround for getting these fixed? The LEDs, if something goes wrong, if a, cust if a customer or resident calls, what is the turnaround? Sure. Um, 
If the product's under warrant, so there's a 10 year warranty with the leading manufacturers of LED street lights. When we place an order for the fixtures, we get extra stock and that can either be stocked in your facility or the contractor's facility. Honestly, most municipalities choose the electrical contractor to stock it and be responsible for it in terms of making sure it's not damaged. Having those on hand allows you that if there was an issue under warranty for basically a, the very next day. So most maintenance contracts are set up where there's a unit price with the electrical contractor to provide routine maintenance and then there could be an emergency category where if there was an accident and they you know, had to respond within you know, an hour or two hours. But generally speaking, a change out of a light under warranty can happen in a day. And if it's out of warranty, you would still have stock on hand. Um, these electrical contractors that specialize in street lighting maintenance, they stock all the common components, you know, four typical you know, poles and lights and wiring and conduit. So it's generally no more than a day or two. And just to add on to that uh, anecdotally, um, one thing to consider is the replacement time that the utility, um, you, you may experience with the utility. We were working, we did a project of this nature with the town of Lancaster, which we'll have more on in a minute as a project example, but one of their driving factors there was their level of dissatisfaction, for lack of a better word, with response times from the utility and having street light outages go on for weeks and weeks and months and months and having that uh, control themselves to immediately dispatch a contractor was something that appealed to them apart from all of the economic value they saw. Any other questions on? Good questions and hopefully the upcoming slides here will address them. Uh, so like Adam said, three of the four or two of the, two of the three here, uh, what are you buying? So going back to typical uh, infrastructure in a town. Uh, the left hand fixture, there's a decorative pole and a decorative fixture on the top we refer to as a post top fixture. Um, you're actually buying the pole and the fixture because you're currently paying a lease rate. You're paying to borrow those if you were to lease those from the utility company and buying them back is really a considerable amount of savings. And looking forward and based on data, the risk of really owning that into the future is pretty minimal. Are there some accidents or knockdowns that occur? There are, but our model, the blue bars budget for that. And municipalities set up the maintenance program where there can be an asset management component where it'll sense that the pole has been knocked down and send out that notice you know, within 45 minutes that it's down. And you can respond to it, you know, your electrical contractor can respond. The second scenario, which is a wood utility pole that has you know, the cable, the phone lines, the electric power, has the arm or the mast with a cobra head. And in the buyback, you're only purchasing the arm and the luminaire. That wood utility pole will remain with the utility company and they're responsible for the wood utility pole. So in this case, if there was a storm or an accident and that pole was knocked down, the utility company responds, they restore power, they install a new pole if necessary, they would just leave that arm and luminaire for your electrical contractor to come and install it. And in the far right example, um, it, it depends on accounts and it depends on location. So in some cases, you may own that steel pole and the luminaire, and in some cases, the utility company may own that steel pole and luminaire. So obviously when we start a project, we go through, we do a GIS audit of every single location Compare it to the invoices, we actually get detailed backup from the utilities an inventory. Uh, we true it up because very often there is inaccuracies, but then we note in GIS the exact information of each location so we know exactly what we need to do and what you know the scope of the contract is. Uh, specifically, I don't have the information here to know 100%, but all the utility bills that were provided for all of the uh, assets that you're paying for are in this analysis. There were some accounts, relatively small, a few hundred dollars, that were accounts of streetlights that appeared to be already owned by the town. And I, from what we could tell, they're like, say, Galleria Drive area. Specifically, the 33, I would have to check. Yeah. Well, you, 
the, the bills are pretty lengthy, so not having them, but I could check and answer that question. So in the project benefits category, or you know, the quality of light, when LED technology was first being adopted, you know, we all know that it was that bluish, almost too bright, not aesthetically pleasing. Um, as it's matured, and it's matured in the outdoor lighting industry, it's, the colors have become softer. So there's something referred to as temperature or Kelvin with lighting. If you, if you buy light bulbs at the store now, you can look at the back. It'll say 2700 soft white, or it may be 3000 or 4000 or 5000. It's that more bluish light. Well, now in outdoor lighting, 3000 has become the norm, which is only a few hundred you know, Kelvin off of what the existing street lighting is. So these two pictures here are before and after for the town of Lancaster. So the top photo is an HID fixture, and the bottom photo is a 3000 Kelvin photo um, fixture. So it's, it's very similar, but it adds more brightness. And because LED technology is directional, it, the light goes to the surfaces where you need it, you know, the sidewalk, the curb, the roadway, and they're dark sky compliant. So there's very little wasted lighting going towards, you know, someone's upper window in an apartment or bedroom window. Um, so it provides really a higher quality light for the public. And it's much more aesthetically pleasing than say seven or eight years ago with higher Kelvin temperature lights. It also is a great platform for adding technology. So street lighting is unique because there's a power source there and different municipalities are capitalizing on that in different ways. I mentioned the asset management system. They make a node that goes on the top of the light um, for you know, a few hundred bucks that allows a cellular network to monitor the light. So it knows if the light is going out, it, can, it monitors amperage and it can tell if the pole gets knocked down and basically automatically send a report internally and copy your electrical contractor. So it gives you a lot of controllability and knowledge. Um, for example, we have some municipalities who have leveraged this technology to set up the automated system and it also allows you to dim the lights. So if there was a town event, you know, there's very often parades or fireworks shows, you can dim lights, you can increase the light output, it gives you flexibility, a lot, of, a lot of bells and whistles. You know, I just, the bullets there, environmental benefits uh, for a lot of municipalities, it's about energy efficiency and sustainability and carbon reduction. So these street lighting projects, um, you know, are high profile projects where municipalities take advantage of and, and reduce their carbon footprint. I've pretty much gone over the maintenance program in a nutshell. It's a third party setup. Uh, we get pricing, competitive pricing at the time, you know, for material and labor to install it. And the town of Lancaster issued an RFP. They've got a, a street lighting contractor. That's all they, they have a division. That's all they do is street lighting maintenance for over 50,000 street lights. Um, and it's been going real smooth. As we mentioned earlier, uh, the numbers that you're seeing tonight are, are not a proposal. It's an overview of what a potential project may be. Um, if you were to consider moving forward, the New York State Energy Law, that a very small section of law, Article 9 of the Energy Law, um, provides an overview of how to proceed. It, it requires municipalities to uh, release a written request for proposals. Um, so. Uh, that would be the process that, that would really be a next step for the town to consider. Um, and again, this section of the energy law, and we can provide you with that, that if you want to, read, it's only a page and a half long, but the, that section of the energy law provides for the procurement process. It provides for the uh, items we mentioned about the guarantee of the savings so that the municipality is made whole in the event there's any sort of shortfall. Um, in the energy savings. It's a protection for the municipality to, to mitigate, mitigate risk. Um, and it also clarifies that, again, this is a, a turnkey project, a, a rare type of turnkey design build project example where you're really hiring one company to do all of the design and construction, whereas normally those are broken up into different agreements and, and, it, and it's a, a much larger undertaking for the municipality to manage.
this may take a second to load, but you know, very often we're asked, you know, what's the process? Okay, the process is similar to a typical capital project, but again, as Adam said, you know, a company such as Wendell would do the design build. Um, but we start out with a GIS field audit, so it's an ArcGIS uh, website uh, that is turned over to the town at the end of the project, incorporated into your GIS platform, and it gives you all the data of exactly what was installed. It's pretty slick. The contractors scan a QR code on the bottom of every light fixture, so it brings in the make, the model, the serial number, the exact date and time of installation for warranty. It's really pretty sophisticated and really leverages technology. Uh, we do photometric design and design process. Very often communities have areas of concern. Uh, it could be intersections where there's been vehicular accidents or pedestrian issues. We look at that, see if the lighting is appropriate, and we can upgrade the lighting. Very often, given the positive cash flow of these projects, some municipalities will add a light here or there as they see fit, so you have flexibility with that as well. Um, we coordinate with your you know, in-house uh, finance and treasury department as well as any outside parties at financing options. We do not finance, uh, but we just provide that information uh, to them for their consideration of leasing versus bonding. Um, the process of the street lighting acquisition uh, is managed by the Public Service Commission. Uh, we coordinate with them from the get-go to make that a smooth transition and schedule for closing. Then we do the construction, which is a six to nine month period. Uh, I would say overall in this process and all the green bars is you know, somewhere between a nine month to 12 month process. It really takes longer for that public service commission approval than it does the other pieces. I have a question about the acquisition. So uh, when we first looked at this back, I think in around 2016, it was still new and the companies, utility companies were not too eager to sell. So yes. it's easier now, you're saying? Yes, that, that, that can be a conversation all in itself. Okay. Um, especially National Grid uh, was seemed to be the least uh, interested in the buyback, mm -hmm. but the uh, state legislature in 2015 really laid the groundwork and now the Public Service Commission has revised National Grid's process for that three different times. Um, we were the first to do National Grid buyback projects in New York State with the City of Oneida and the City of Albany. And working with the City of Albany attorney and the Public Service Commission, uh, the process that National Grid follows was somewhat reformed. And New York State Electric and Gas has actually been pretty easy going through the whole process. Right. And we've done projects with both utilities. Right. We provide a lot of you know, support in that area because obviously it'd be new for you to go through that process. We have, our portfolio is over 50 projects right now of projects that are completed or in design. Um, it's coming up here in a second, the slide. Plenty of projects in Western New York, across New York State with all the upstate New York utilities. So that's just the sampling uh, municipalities that we're working with or have worked with. So our, our LED street lighting work in, in Western New York is, is fairly robust. As you'll see, there are a number of towns and cities and villages taking advantage of this technology. Just surrounding Cheektowaga, we've talked about uh, the town of Lancaster. That project was just completed uh, last year. They went through this exact type of process that we've laid out tonight. Um, we're sort of in the middle of going through this process with the town of Amherst. They're still in the design phase, so construction hasn't started yet. They haven't taken ownership of the assets back from the utility, but, but we're working towards that process. So, you know, the, you know, right when the Public Service Commission approves that asset transfer, we'll be ready to go with uh, construction. Um, and then there are a number, another of Umber, excuse me, another of other municipalities, the village of Lancaster has also recently completed their project and there are others also in the design phase. So we've got a number of projects in, that have been completed but also sort of in the design and development phases. Yeah, I think we have one last slide. Um, Adam touched on the, the town of Lancaster. Obviously it's a great reference for us. We can share other references of projects if you request. I'll be glad to share that list. So 
you know, a lot of a, a lot of people react to this like it's too good to be true. How can I save more money than it's going to cost me to do the project? You know, it'd be one thing that if I saved enough to pay for it. But what you're telling me, Wendell, is I'm going to save more money than it's going to cost me annually to pay this project back. It's almost too good to be true. Um, this is, these are the actual bills here for the town of Lancaster. On the left-hand side of the screen is actually a snippet of multiple bills. Um, they had six utility accounts. When they started the process, they've consolidated them into one. Uh, but if you add up the cost of those six utility bills on the left and compare it to the cost of the project afterwards, it's a 77% savings. So their monthly bill on the left-hand side, which the example I pulled was September 2017, and generally speaking, street lighting costs are pretty much the same every month. They vary a little bit. But in September 2017, their monthly bill was $21,000. And then in September 2020, after the project, their bill was $4,800. So the proof is there. Uh, there's several municipalities that are seeing the savings that we, you know, calculate uh, and guarantee in the contracts, and they've had a very good experience with the program overall. So just uh, in closing, to come full circle, this underscores those bills there represent how you're repurposing the money that you're already spending paying on your utility bills to finance the project and you know th those bills are the source of the information uh, that the town of Lancaster used to develop their annual budget so when you think that earlier side for how much cheek to is spending on street lighting you know that's where the money for the project comes from you're repurposing those dollars and achieving savings so that's really all we have for you tonight we're um, Happy to answer any additional questions that you have uh, about the process, about the technology. Council Member Noah. Yeah, I've got a few questions. Uh, the sure. first has to do with the buyback options. Yep. So for this theoretical project, uh, what are the what does the buyback situation look like? What percentage of the polls would uh, the town be taking on? Because the ownership situation right now here between the two energy companies and going neighborhood by neighborhood, it's pretty confusing. Some some streets. We own part of the poll. Some streets we own more. It depends if you're dealing with NYSEG or National Grid. Uh, in my mind, I would want to get to a place where we streamlined the stuff and made it as close to the same everywhere and made it as simple as possible. So it sounds like we would be buying the vast majority of polls in that. Uh, but can you talk a little bit more about what buyback would look like under our proposal here? Sure. sure. Generally speaking, municipalities will buy pretty much everything because of how you know, good the results can be financially. But in our GIS audit, and I'm, I'm not sure this will answer your question, so you know, please tell me if not. Um, we do the GIS inventory of what's there now, and we work with the engineering department to make things consistent. So if one street has 250 watt metal halides, another street has 400 watt, you know, why is there a difference? Is it a different roadway type? Is it residence, residential setback different? But we do that in the audit phase and in the design phase to create consistency. Um, so I think, you know, it's maybe a two-part answer, but the buyback, generally they buy back everything. And then we make sure there's consistency in the design going forward to make it more streamlined for maintenance. And when you look down a street, it'll be much more consistent lighting than seeing a bright area and a, you know, a shadowy area, et cetera. I'm not personally working on that job, but Wendell is. That's correct. Okay, so you both got more time yes.
generally speaking, we do go border to border. Um, we don't have the slide here, but we have slides showing, you know, for example, the town of Amherst in our GIS application shows the border of the town of Amherst. Every single light has been identified and every single light will be part of the buyback. And they do have some nice egg lights on transit road. So they also do have accounts with both utilities. That's a small percentage, but yes, we're looking, we follow your direction and your goals and objectives with the project, but generally speaking, municipalities look to go townwide or village wide with the project, not just primary streets or secondary streets. It's across the board. Correct. Our, our request for information is very exhaustive. We, we collect all the utility invoices and then during the buyback process, we request the backup that the utilities have for each pole and each light fixture and then compare the two. And then we go out and actually physically, Wendell, Wendell's you know, engineers go out and physically locate every light and compare that information. It is. Um, that's a very good question. So it's not mandatory that you have a third party contractor. Um, most municipalities find that reassuring that if something does come up, they've got someone on the call. However, there are some municipalities who are using their own highway department resources to do decorative post stops if they're qualified electricians. However, the Cobra heads that are up on wood utility poles where there are high power lines that is considered a linesman qualified individual and most municipalities do not employ a linesman. There's a special OSHA code. Um, we do actually. Okay, well then in your case. We, we do that, have a senior traffic technician. Right. Uh, the highest, yeah. There's a specific linesman OSHA training requirement to work in that space because it's a utility space. Mm -hmm. So if you had that qualification, that would be an option you could consider. We'll double check, but I think he does. Yeah, the, the short answer is no. If it's a wood utility pole with other utilities on it, I don't. Need, it's not even an option really for the municipality to because of the significance of it. The utility wants control of that. Um, there are wood utility poles in some areas that we find in New York State that are for lighting only. The village of Depew, for example, does have wood poles that only serve the purpose of lighting. Uh, the town of Greece has some in that case. So in that case, yes, you can take over the wood pole but in like the photo that I had in the middle, if it has utilities on it, we wouldn't recommend you take ownership of that either. Yeah. I think that's, that's just too much to take on responsibility wise. city of time can we try to wrap it up so just uh, comment to everybody that you should be using your microphones um, we're testing our zoom meeting and I'm not sure how well you're gonna be heard unless you use the microphone in the future okay uh, uh, council member uh, Florsky so the 9.6 million dollar ballpark price that's for the 7655 lights that's all the lights in the town for that cost Correct. Those are the implementation costs for 7,600 lights. Oh. Yes. And is that before or after anything like NYSERDA or energy efficiency and conservation block grant or New York State's Smart Start street lighting programs? Any of those grants or funding sources? Um, so the nine and a half million dollar figure, you can subtract three of that 
there's the estimated buyback cost. So we can think about six, uh, six and a half million dollars, the project implementation cost, which namely includes material, labor, professional services, and contingency. The other items you mentioned are reflected in the project economics to a degree, but they're not necessarily part of the, the first cost implementation costs. In other words, we do go back and get all of the available incentives from the utilities for the up upgrades to the more energy efficient lights. Other than that, at this time, it does not take into account any other outside grant funding that the town may um, achieve uh, and, um, through any, any state or federal programs uh, or any other buy down or you know, local contribution of financial resources the town would be willing to make. You know, should those things come to fruition, um, that'll only serve to improve the project economics. Mm -hmm. Just to maybe help clarify Adam's response to that question, so there's no grant money in that $9 million. The incentives are not taken off of the $9 million. The incentives are shown coming in when you qualify for them, which is after installation. So if you notice in this bar chart in year one how much bigger that green is, that is money coming back from the utilities as a rebate. Because you, know, you don't get that money when you buy the light. You still have to borrow the $9 million. You get it back later. Mm -hmm. So it's shown in the cash flow as money coming in after the project is completed. And just to clarify, the interest would be, the theoretical interest here is built into the total of the 9.5, right? That's correct. And you're right, that's a the theoretical interest rate. You know, obviously we coordinate with Brian and others as to what your interest rates are at the time. But for now, that's a placeholder. Mm -hmm. And interest isn't factored into the blue bars. Anybody else so we can close this I out? Have one okay. Quick question relative to the maintenance engineering. What's uh, your average price for the system for the building? Do you know? Well, in addition to the t uh, 10 year warranty, the estimated uh, lifespan of the luminaire itself is, is approaching 25 years. Yeah. That's why we're really modeling a 25 year cash flow scenario here. Yeah, the, the, the technology is not only more energy efficient, but it typically requires less maintenance. Um, the failure rate is, is very small. Other municipalities that have projects um, in, in place have experienced failure rates of you know, one or less percent a year. Um, uh, there's a slide here that represents this. Some of all, you know, it, it's still, a, I don't want to say an emerging technology because everyone's using LED in their homes. Um, but as, as far as a widespread street lighting application goes, data is still being gathered from the municipal level. So cities like Los Angeles um, have implemented projects and other large cities, and they're seeing, you know, 0.2% failure rate or 1% failure rate. Um, that's a lot more manageable than, than many other types of technology. Okay. Thank you so much, Adam and Keith, for doing this great presentation it really was eye-opening thank you thank you for your time and you have our presentations if there are any follow-up questions later feel free to get in touch with us yes you left your business card so yes. we can call you directly thank you. thank you so much okay next item would be the town board resolutions uh, we do have a public hearing tonight uh, regarding 6386 transit road and Sean Hopkins is going to be here in person tonight. Uh, then we have our consent agenda items. Uh, the first resolution is the transfer of funds. Uh, so just stop me if anybody wants to stop and discuss any item. Second resolution is the warrant. Uh, three is cancellation of the fire inspector course. Uh, four is adopting our local law, one of the, for the naming of streets, parks, and public buildings. Um, nobody had any comments at the public hearing last time. Uh, five is uh, the call for public hearing for the rezoning of 4945 to 4959 Genesee Street. Six is the notice to bidders for pool maintenance chemicals, the yearly item, or I think every three years. Uh, seven is the negative speaker declaration for 2804 Union Road, which is the five-star five auto mode. 
and uh, eight is accept the site plan for the five-star automotive. Nine is to access the control service agreement. Ten is the donation of the police department's tough books. We do have our department heads here. If anybody needs them, you know, we, we can always ask them questions. Eleven, <coughs> excuse me, is the migration of cellular service and mobile device infrastructure improvements. Twelve is the uh, authorize the purchase of a multifunction unit. Thirteen is authorize the supervisor to terminate Amherst Security Professionals Agreement. Uh, 14 is authorized supervisor to execute memorandum of understanding with the softball baseball organizations and then the next couple have different organizations um, 15 is for the Algonquin sports they're providing some tennis instruction and same thing for 16 game on sports and Jill Gorman couldn't be here tonight but I think she sent everybody an email one of the um, companies is going to do it in the north part of town, and one company is doing it in the south part of town. That's why we have two. Any questions on that? Okay, 17 would be uh, authorized supervisor to execute an intermunicipal agreement between the town and Erie Community College relative to the use of the town of Chittawaga Police Department firing range. 18 is the youth and recreation terminations. 19 is the youth and recreation transfers. Then 20 is the youth and recreation hiring. As you know, we're doing a lot of hiring for youth and rec because of our programming and our pool. One pool is opening. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, 21 is the youth and recreation hiring for the non-resident -re uh, lifeguard which we have done in the past because of the shortage of lifeguards. 22 is the hiring and termination of part-time seasonal employees. And there have been several changes, so hopefully everybody has the updated version. 23, we have some uh, appointments uh, for uh, the Senior Microcomputer Technical Support Specialist, Joe Fadina. It will be provisional and a um, non competitive mo motor equipment operator A in sewer. 25 is uh, appointment of a motor equipment operator A in the sanitation department. 26 is the appointment of a building and zoning clerk provisional in the building and plumbing department. And 27 is the appointment of a records inventory clerk in the town clerk's office. And we have several travel authorizations. Uh, 28 is the uh, travel authorization for the police department. 29 is the travel authorization for uh, the town assessor. And 30 is the Senior Services Department travel authorization. Any questions on those or comments? And then we have some waiver items. Okay, the first waiver item is the appointment of a sewer maintenance worker in the sewer maintenance department. This was an internal bid, meaning that it was um, a union employee bid on this position. Then we needed to appoint a new drug enforcement representative temporarily Anthony Romano. Uh, three is the uh, uh, authorized supervisor to execute agreement with the Erie County Board of Elections for the use of the town of Chictawaga Senior Center and Dart Dartwood Community Center for the election polling locations. Uh, call for public hearing is number four for the 2021 comprehensive plan. We're getting close. <laughs> And number five is the appointment of our, our new coordinator of employee relations, uh, Brian P. Horsman, who was here tonight for the work session. 
Brian, do you want to stand up so everybody can? Yes, but we found somebody. <laughs> so tonight we'll be appointing him. Thank you, Brian. Any questions on anything? Anybody? Okay. On, on part time. Yes. Yeah. There, that's why I said make sure you, you take a look at because there was some change in there. Okay. So we, there is a need for an executive session. We're going up to the council uh, conference room uh, to discuss TCEA and PBA collective negotiations, the employment history of a particular employee, and matters leading to the appointment of a particular person. So I'll make the motion and seconded by Council Member Adamzak. All in favor? Opposed? Motion carried. 556. 